welcome everyone. Um, as I said, I'm Katie Larson. For those of you who have not met me, I am the Education Manager at the Alliance for the Great Lakes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tyrone Dobson. I'm the Senior Volunteer Engagement Manager here at the Alliance. I'm really excited you guys are joining us here in the room as well as those on the phone. Um, it should be a really exciting uh, evening, a lot of information to be shared. Um, I'm Anjali. I'm an outreach affiliate. Thank you all for coming. Hi, I'm Olivia Rita. I'm the Illinois and Indiana Outreach Affiliate here at the Alliance. Um, and we're like, like we all said, we're super excited to have you all here to talk about plastic pollution. It's definitely a super big issue facing the Great Lakes. So we're happy to have you all help us spread awareness about this issue. Um, so to kind of put this into context into what the Alliance does at large, for those of you that maybe don't know as much about what the Alliance does, um, our mission here is to conserve and restore the world's largest freshwater resource using policy, education, and local efforts ensuring a healthy Great Lakes and clean water for generations of people and wildlife to come. So how we're able to do this is we have thousands and thousands of people that help us each year with different facets of trying to accomplish this mission. Um, a lot of educators are involved in their classrooms teaching different topics of the Great Lakes. Um, different elected politicians help to support policies that protect our Great Lakes now and for years to come. Um, we have a lot of volunteers that take part in our adopt the beach cleanups. And of course, all of you as lovely people, our ambassadors, really help us to spread our word to the community even further. So super grateful to have you all with us. So to kind of emphasize just how important the Great Lakes and the health of the Great Lakes is, 97% um, of the world surface water is salt water. So the remaining 3%, 2% of that is frozen in glaciers. And the last 1% of that, almost 20% is in the Great Lakes. So it's the largest surface freshwater ecosystem in the world. So it's super important that we protect this um, for wildlife, for the ecosystem, and for all of us. Um, one of the biggest reasons for that is that over 40 million people are getting their drinking water from this resource. And that includes one in 10 Americans and one in four Canadians. So super important and vital ecosystem. So an overview of how the rest of the presentation will go today. Um, we'll first talk about some of the research and data on plastic pollution in the Great Lakes, kind of what we're looking at, how much plastic has infiltrated the ecosystem. Then we'll look at what kind of impact this is having on the environment, on wildlife, on people in our communities. And then lastly, some hope, how can we address this issue um, and make an impact and hopefully not have it be as much of an issue in the future. Um, just to reiterate, We'll definitely have some time after the presentation for questions. So those of you viewing via the webinar, feel free at any point to put a question in the chat and we'll be sure to get to that at the end. And for those of you attending in person, feel free to jot some notes down. We have the slides printed out um, for any questions and we can all discuss that at the end. Okay, so I'm gonna dive right into plastic pollution. Um, this chart shows most of the tons. Um, of plastic buildup over the past 75 years. Um, as you can see, it's grown exponentially, and this is because over 50% of the world's plastic has been created in the past 13 years, which is really startling, I think. Um, about 60 to 80% of it is, ends up in landfills, and only about 9% of it is recycled, um, even though this is the majority of the plastic that, is, that goes to these places. About 10,000 metric tons enters the Great Lakes every year. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about our Adopt-A-Beach events. These are the beach cleanups we do in all five lakes and um, all, all eight Great Lakes states. Um, on average, we pick up about 80, we pick up about 35,000 pounds of trash and between 85 and 90% of that is plastic. Um, and the majority of it, for those who are here, looks like what's in these jars that we passed around. Um, so most of it is really small. <coughs> Um, okay, so once this plastic is in the environment, what exactly is happening to it? Um, it's obviously breaking down in um, different ways to get smaller and smaller. Um, so it's either doing that via mechanical methods like, you know, waves or friction, um, but also due to photodegradation, which is when it's breaking down due to sunlight and air. Um, so sunlight, specifically oxygen, the plastic is oxidized, causing it to be more brittle um, and able to break down. But a lot of times this takes quite a long time because when these pieces of plastic are underwater, they have less exposure to sunlight and oxygen, so that can that <clears throat> can take quite a while. Um, and this contrasts to biodegradation, which is where organic materials are decomposed via microbes. Um, so we talked a little bit about this for those attending in person, but for 
those attending via webinar, um, we have a really neat learning tool that we use, debris degradation cards, and we use those at different tabling events or especially talking with um, student groups or just really anyone in the community. It's kind of a good engaging activity. It has an item, a photo of an item on the front that would, we might you know, find on the beach or just disposed of in our environment in general. And then on the back, it says how long it takes to <coughs> biodegrade or photodegrade. So it's just a cool way to get people thinking about it and kind of seeing where their head's at, like do, you know, how long do they think it takes to degrade and then how long it actually takes to degrade. Um, so this is definitely something we can help provide to people if they're interested in using this um, at an event as an ambassador. Olivia, I was just gonna say that I gave a presentation at the Field Museum today with a group of teachers yeah. and we used the debris degradation cards and they all wanted them uh, to Very use in cool. the classroom. But it was just like really surprising to them, the monofilament fishing line that that would take 600 years. They said like, it's so thin, how could it take that long? Um, so there's, it's just like a really engaging, the cards are really engaging. And I've used them at tabling events and just had like a few out on the table um, and had people like try to put them in the order of like fastest to slowest. So they're just a really engaging um, conversation starter. Definitely. Yeah, thanks, Kitty. Yeah, definitely. I think whenever we used them, it has really thought positive feedback. You can even do it where like each person has like a card and then tries to like order themselves together. Um, it's kind of a cool way to get people talking about it for sure. But yeah, we could definitely provide you all with those. Um, so like I mentioned, 10,000 metric tons of plastic enter the Great Lakes each year. Uh, 2018 studies suggest that uh, 1 billion plastic particles are just on the surface of Lake Michigan. Um, each microparticle is about 5 millimeters or less, but the majority of it is 1 millimeter or less. Um, so like Anjali said, a lot of what we look at is some microplastics in open water, but it's also important to look at microplastics um, in tributaries that are then going to make their way into our Great Lakes. Um, so there was a study done that looked at just this. They looked at 29 tributaries and took like surface water samples from those tributaries, and they found that there was quite a difference in the type of form that the plastic was taking. So they found um, in the in the open water in the Great Lakes that the large majority of what they were looking at, um, for those looking at the webinar, it's the left part of the graph there, um, was fragments. But however, in the tributaries, what they were mainly finding were fibers and lines. So these are pieces of fishing line, fishing net, also parts of fibers from synthetic textiles like clothing, blankets, um, that were making their way into the Great Lakes. So this kind of emphasizes the fact that once the plastic is getting into the water, it kind of, due to a number of different factors, is taking on different forms and that might have varying effects on the ecosystem. Um, one hypothesis about why this is occurring is that those fibers and lines in a river, for example, the motion of the water is allowing them to kind of maybe stay up near the surface and get captured, whereas in the lake environment that would be likely settling to the bottom. Um, but something to think about is in that lake environment, the benthic organisms are probably being affected by those fibers in different ways than they would in a river, for example. Um, so just how much plastic are we looking at entering the Great Lakes? Anjali referenced this. Um, so there's, there was a study done at Rochester Institute of Technology, and they were able to estimate that over 22 million pounds are entering the Great Lakes every year. So that's a lot of plastic, huge issue, really infiltrating the whole ecosystem. Um, they were able to estimate this based on a mathematical model that looked at population from a certain distance from the coast. Um, and multiplying that by the amount of litter that's being mismanaged. Um, so they were able to use different models and kind of get an estimate on that. Um, so that's kind of a good way to just sort of like be thinking about just how much plastic we're talking about. Okay, so what kind of effect is this having? So we'll first talk about what kind of effect it's having on wildlife. So one major issue is that a lot of wildlife are getting entangled in this plastic. Um, we've seen probably a lot of photos of different marine species having being dolphins being caught up in plastic, sea turtles. Um, this is definitely also happening in our Great Lakes. So this is impeding their ability to move around, to look for food, um, to otherwise live. Definitely a huge issue to think about. Um, also talking about wildlife, there's an issue with them ingesting the plastic pieces. 
Um, oftentimes they're confusing it with food, and this is a concern for a number of reasons, one being a loss of nutrients, so that plastic is taking up room that would otherwise be occupied by important nutrients that they need to be consuming. Also, to think about these plastic pieces inherently have some chemicals in them, but they're also able to absorb a lot of chemicals, um, they're absorbent and able to absorb chemicals in the water. So the wildlife is ingesting that, and obviously that's going up the food chain, so humans are, you know, if they're ingesting fish, um, there's not a whole lot of facts known yet about what exactly is happening once humans are ingesting particle pieces of plastic, um, but there have been remnants of that in human waste, so we definitely know it's making its way up the food chain. Um, so I came across like an interesting study in National Geographic. Um, this article was talking about um, a particular situation. It was off the coast of Hawaii, so it's an ocean environment, um, but some similarities can be drawn in the Great Lakes and similar things have been seen. But I thought I had some good visuals. Um, they were particularly looking, particularly sorry, looking at oily slicks. Um, so this, these areas had a lot of like uh, larval stages of fish in particular, um, and they were noticing that it had pretty devastating effects because, especially since they're um, in developmental stages, even just like a small little strand was, you know, really detrimental. This image in particular I thought was a good visual because on the left would would be like food that they would be normally consuming um, from this like and on the right a, a bunch of like plastic particles that are intermixed within that. Um, and once again, the larval stages of the fish, they might not be as developed, maybe not able, as much able to recognize the difference, so they're ingesting a lot of that. Okay, so aside from wildlife health, there's, there's also some research on human health. Um, like she said, there are some particles that have ended up in, well, they go in the fish and then they go in the humans, but also there have been found to be nanoparticles in bottled water, tap water, uh, beer that's made in the Great Lakes region, salt, honey, um, highly processed foods, and these can continue to break down until they're a fraction of a millimeter big and they can pass through cell walls. And after that, they just really live in your body. And we don't really know the effects of that on, on the human body, but this is something that's becoming a bigger deal. Um, so aside from health, there are also a lot of socioeconomic factors to consider. So for example, areas that have more pollution and specifically plastic pollution, there is less tourism, especially to coastal areas, which means that less people attend small businesses. Um, and also areas with higher litter rates have more crime, and this has been shown to decrease property values by up to 7%. Okay, so we know that plastic is having a really big effect on the ecosystem, on wildlife, on us. So how can we um, address this issue? So it'd be great if there was like a one great solution, a big net we could tow around and collect all the plastic, but not the case. It'd be really great if it was. Um, so we kind of, right now at least, are having to tackle it from many different, you know, fast, many different strategies. Um, so we'll kind of go into like some of those right now. So one being collection. So once the plastic's out there, um, collect, you know, collecting it once it's already a problem. Um, we do this with our adopted beach cleanups. We have people out there collecting a bunch of litter off the beach so that it won't then end up into the Great Lakes issues. Um, there's also a huge connection with wastewater treatment plants, so collecting that plastic before and after it's there so that it's not then going into the Great Lakes. There's also some products we can use at home. So when we're throwing synthetic clothing into the washer machine, that could then end up in our Great Lakes. So there's a couple different products that have been developed. On the bottom left on that slide, you can see it's called a Cora, Cora ball. Um, and it's able to trap some of those microfibers and then you you can then physically remove them yourself and dispose of them in a better way than it being washed into the Great Lakes. There's also a laundry bag that's like a similar concept. Um, but when thinking about collection, it's good to kind of visualize like an overflowing sink and like what would be the best way to um, fix that? Would it be to continuously collect buckets of that water or to just turn off the sink, right? So it's kind of like <laughs> addressing it once it's an issue versus trying to address the symptom. Okay. <laughs> so another way to attack this is through management. So trying to get the plastic before it's ending up in the Great Lakes. Um, and some different management strategies might involve looking at recycling bins, for example. So on the left, you'll see varying 
um, types of recycling bins, the one on the left having no lid, the one in the middle having a lid, and then the one on the, the farthest right has a latching lid. So we're able to go ahead and latch that tight so that nothing's falling out. Um, so people are bringing it to the right place, but then if it's falling out, that's obviously also an issue. Um, the image on the right is like a cool product, kind of a creative way to incentivize people to throw their litter away correctly. It's a voting ashtray, so it might have like an engaging question to get people to put their cigarette butts in, um, you know, in the ashtray. And that's a good way to kind of um, decrease the amount of cigarette butts that we see on the beach. We, that is one of the highest um, seen items that we see. Okay, um, another way to attack this is through policy. So in, in the city of Chicago, we have a seven cent fee on all disposable plastic bags. And so the first graph shows the uh, number of disposable bags used per trip. And in Chicago, it declined by a lot, whereas in other cities, it didn't decline by much. And then if the second graph shows how many reusable bags people start using in Chicago after the city was enacted. Um, and I know this is only one city, but it actually made a really big difference. And uh, New York State is now enacting a full ban starting in March of 2020. Uh, Cuyahoga County in Ohio did this, and there's a lot of uh, legislation looking at straws and other types of plastic to prevent this. Um, so aside from legislation, a lot of companies and big corporations are starting to take a lot more social responsibility. Uh, so these show ways that um, all these companies are trying to reduce their, pl their plastic footprint. Uh, one example I really like is Trader Joe's. So in 2019 alone, they reduced their plastic by 4 million pounds. And this cut costs, this got more people to go to their stores because it was a really popular move and they were able to sell a lot more. And so it's now becoming a bigger incentive for companies to cut their plastic. Um, okay, so another way to address source reduction and not as much plastic getting into the Great Lakes is looking at what we can do on a personal level. So we thought we'd take a few minutes and if we can all just sort of think about maybe things we do now or things we could do that help cut down on plastic use or how plastic is, you know, ending up in the Great Lakes. Um, so yeah, we kind of, we really did discuss a lot of these. Um, you guys had some really good ideas. Um, the last thing we want to touch on is our Great Lakes Adopt the Beach program. We've mentioned this a lot throughout our presentation. So these are Adopt the Beach cleanups that are happening throughout the year. Um, there's an opportunity to get involved just as a volunteer signing up on our website. You can also lead them as a team leader. And some really cool opportunity as an ambassador, you can attend one of these cleanups and maybe present about Great Lakes plastic pollution or maybe another topic if you're interested. Um, so we have like a Chicago ambassador event sign-up sheet, but if you're in a different area, let us know and we can reach out to you with opportunities. But that sign-up sheet has all of the opportunities right now for September, including our September Adopt the Beach running from 13th to 29th. So you can let us know if there's a cleanup that you're interested in going to. So feel free to like chat with each other for a second. And if anyone wants to add anything in the chat, um, we can talk about that in a minute here. Um, but I think you guys really hit on all the ones we were going to discuss. We had talked about going to Adopted Beach um, cleanups and disseminating information that way. We have our Plastic Free Great Lakes Pledge. Um, a lot of times, I know there was a tabling event done recently by ambassadors, and instead of having paper sign-in sheets, they had people like sign in with a Plastic Free Pledge. So that's a good option. Um, like I said, we'll be able to get you this Plastic Free Great Lakes toolkit. So that has a lot of this information we've been talking about. And like I said, it had a lot of good, like I think, points about how to content effectively contact legislatures. Um, Will we have access to this presentation because some of these things are a little bit hard to Okay, read. yeah, we can definitely get this presentation now. Okay. Oh, yeah, well, I'll be sending it out. Okay. Okay. One last shameless plug as the person that manages Adopted Beach. <laughs> um, I really, really, really would appreciate it if y'all would take, you know, some thought if you could attend an event. A lot of our team leaders are inundated with people, so it, like it might not sound like a lot to have 20 people show up at once, but let me tell you, it's very stressful to try to hand out trash bags, gloves, get them to mm. do all the things. And sometimes they just miss like the spiel part of talking about why it's important. So they get people moving on the program. So like, I want you to start picking up trash because that's what people are jazzed up for. They don't necessarily want to sit and listen to you talk, right? <laughs> and so it helps the team leader if you're able to be there and talk about the issue while they're like doing the logistical yeah. part of the cleanup. 
Um, and that we found that as people, like we run these, Olivia, Anjali and I, Katie as well, it just really helps to have a second person. It's like, like mingling with people, talking about why it's important. Not to yeah. mention that one-on-one -on -one is way more approachable and you can start to tailor the message and get to know them a little bit better and like make that make sense for someone. You just never know what that, what that one conversation could do to change. And it's like that small incremental change. So if you get one person to say they're going to go buy some reusable straws, well, then we made it. That's like check mark for one positive step towards making a difference, right? So that's like my shameless plug to like, please, please, please consider that. <laughs> it yeah, definitely, definitely works, Iron. It definitely works. Yeah. Right on cue. <laughs> <laughs> and you can use the cool visuals we talked about. Like I said, we'll get you guys these degradation cards if you wanted to bring that to a cleanup. That would be like. Not to mention that these items are things that you will find at a cleanup. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, did you know that it takes? If you just memorize. Hey, yeah. Like, uh, but, you know, 50 that's a little years, bit. That's straw you just picked up. Like that kind of stuff really starts to engage our volunteers in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we drink out of that. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely find a lot of those. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so, all Kate, so much. There's the, uh, there's the newest volunteer in your arms there. Yep. Oh. She's ready for September Adopt a Beach in, yeah, one month from today. She's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty excited about that. Um, awesome. <laughs> um, I put the volunteer, the calendar. Google Drive spreadsheet in the chat box, and I know that was also part of the presentation. Uh, so there, there is a space to put if you're able to go to an Adopt-a-Beach event, but we also have a presentation and some tabling events coming up um, in September. So hopefully we can get those slots filled. And thanks again. I know we ran over time, but it was good conversation and good questions. I just appreciate everyone's time. And yeah, um, I know the Chicago office will stay on, but Amelia and I are gonna are gonna sign off. <laughs>